started today. If anyone joins in, we can, we can continue to admit people as they, as they roll in. Thank you everyone for joining today. Super excited about today's webinar. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm, I'm Manit Mahindra, I'm the Shadow Team. I'm a senior associate here in Shadow Partners. Uh, like I said, really excited about today's webinar. Um, we're gonna walk you through our dial framework. Um, which really is focused around uh, how you approach an innovation strategy, innovation journey within the built industry. And today, uh, it's going to our webinar is going to be led by KP, uh, which is great. KP is usually uh, pretty pretty busy, so it was great to be able to find time and have him uh, help lead this group effort today. Now, just some general housekeeping items: uh, we are using Teams today. Uh, full transparency, I haven't run a webinar with Teams before. Uh, but we have everything set up. So if you have any questions uh, throughout the webinar, uh, please go ahead and enter them in the Q&A. Um, you can just ask a question right there and we'll make sure that it gets answered. Uh, and then hopefully at the end, we'll, we'll have a little bit of time um, as well to just sort of make sure that we cover any additional questions that anyone may have. So without uh, further delay, I will kick things over to you, KP. All right, thanks, Mana. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, it's been a minute since we've done webinars. It's also my first time using Teams. So if any time it gets uh, uncomfortable, um, I blame Teams. So uh, we'll kind of get, get started. I'd like to start relatively on time. So kind of the purpose of this is just um, really to help communicate um, kind of the word innovation and what people are doing and, um, and kind of share some of our findings quite honestly of what we've been learning over the years and in my case for over the last 30 years so um so a little bit of kind of what you what to expect today we're going to talk a little bit just perfunctory about the team uh and and a little bit about the forces and the opportunity as we start thinking about like innovation and frameworks and uh, as well as we're going to talk about how do you build a framework and then uh, hopefully have some time for some questions. So real quick, like why, why are we doing this? Um, so I'll get into my story a little bit, but we, we still fundamentally believe and have believed for me the, for the last 30 years that innovation is imperative to our industry. So the mission of Shadow Partners here is really to kind of put together tight-knit communities. It's not about tens of thousands of people. It's about hundreds of people that actually care about driving innovation. And we get them together and we do things like this, which we consider educational in terms of workshops. Um, we also believe that collaboration is key. So we run a lot of in-person, a few in-person events, our annual summit. Many of you guys have joined us for that. Um, we also provide some advisory stuff along the way for people that have more advanced needs. And of course, a lot of y'all know us from our uh, venture funds, Shadow Ventures as well. So from there, just a little bit, and, and I think I hate talking about myself, but I'm gonna do it anyway, um, just for context and background. Um, second generation civil engineer, I've been writing code since I was 13, built companies, focused, you know, worked as an engineer in, in, in actually field engineering and built a lot of companies, wrote a couple of books, one around startups uh, and one around BIM back in 2011. Spent some time with Frank Geary at Geary Technologies um, and then ran Georgia Tech's incubator. All this to say that the, the long story short is I've spent my entire career trying to drive innovation in this industry and it's taken various forms, whether it's a startup, whether it's consulting, whether it's as an investor. Uh, and, and we fundamentally believe that there's still now more than ever an opportunity, um, but it's also wrought with lots of uh, challenges along the way. And we'll talk about that a little bit because I think it's important. Um, and one thing I was reviewing uh, our attendees today, our registrations anyway, and it seems to be kind of a good mix of corporate, kind of called architects, engineers, contractors, and real estate folks. Uh, as well as startups. Um, and so there's something, I would say it's two sides of the coin when we talk about innovation. And we're, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Manav introduced himself. Uh, a lot of y'all also know Ian and of, and of course myself, so not gonna spend too much time on this. But but the question is why, why now? And, and so the reason I bring up why now, like why is now the time for innovation? Um, I, I'd like to talk about my first startups when I was, 
19, building some software, went to go work as an engineer. Uh, in 1997, I launched a startup focused on uh, construction management on the web. And in 1997, I took it to market backed by uh, my biggest investor was uh, Discover Card. I, I took a cash advances against my Discover Card to build the company and went to market with this great construction management on the web uh, product in 1997. I was quickly told by the market um, that the internet was a fad. What is this AOL? Like, what are you doing? No one's going to ever manage a, pro a project on the internet. It's all going to come down to a guy with the truck rolling out a set of prints. That's what construction is. You're out of your mind. Um, burn rate was high. Cash was low. I was super fortunate to meet some guys in the telecom industry. And they viewed deploying internet switches and gear and central offices in the telecom space looked a lot like construction. And they were super interested and adopted my product. That company went from two people to 1,200 people in three years, and we took it public. Um, so that was a big win. But it, it was also like my first um, exposure to a market not being ready for what I had as an entrepreneur. And so when you look at like the, the why now, um, our, our belief system, and you know, some of this is opinion supported by data, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this. Um, you know, if you look at it, we're just hitting kind of the innovation window for our industry. Uh, other industries have hit it, but we're now starting to see it. If you look at the early winners in our space, you know, whether it's the Autodesk, et cetera, they've really kind of become the incumbent providers. And now we're starting to see the, the, um, the challengers come into market and we're actually starting to see adoption. Um, one of the things to note, you know, when we look at our industry, um, we might be behind. I think that's fair to say. However, you know, we're now starting to catch up and, and there's a lot of reasons for it. But but our belief system is. For the next. Couple decades or so, it's going to be growth in our space in terms of how innovation takes shape, form and how it moves forward. So when we look at that. Like, what are those forces, you know, and, and you want to look at kind of the market forces and there's some basics here that are kind of creating this, you know, for lack of a better term, a perfect storm. And these market forces are things like global infrastructure. There's uh, a need for massive in infrastructure improvements. We all know this. I don't think that's that's new housing shortage. We can't create enough houses, and if you look at the housing shortage, if you if you just just um, if you look at that against the, the waste in construction, you know if we could reduce waste by five percent in construction, we could probably give everybody on the planet a free house, right? It's the scale is there, um, so we have those issues, and of course this energy transition, which we've all been hearing about, starting to experience, um, that that is an ongoing movement. And you also are seeing the capital now, whether it's governments, the government side of things, or even private capital uh, deploying into the energy transition. Fourth is like labor shortage. Um, unfortunately, um, we're graduating more kids that would rather be Instagram influencers than swing a hammer. Um, but we will continue to have this labor shortage, even if you just look at macro populations and where people are living and how people are operating will continue to have this labor shortage. So I don't think it's a short term thing. It's a it's a longer term issue. And then if you look at what I call the race to the bottom, um, there are certain characteristics and in culture in our industry where price matters. Um, we have these um, wild things like uh, bidding, right? So if you look at public bids, there's definitely a push to the bottom. And trying to get the best price, and that that just continues, um, continues to hit margins. Um, so if you take those market forces and you match that against some of the technical forces, um, if you look at the technical risk, you know you you definitely have much more reduced technical risk. When I was an engineer, um, this is circa 1995. For those of you that are keeping count. Um, I instrumented a job site. It was a, uh, a 
a mass transit station and I instrumented the entire station to do to do settlement analysis. It took me a $10,000 Panasonic Tough book. I had to run cable through the job site to, to put my sensors all over the job site. And I had to put them all into a, a junction box. And once a day, I'd come in and connect serial port into this box to download all my data into Quattro Pro um, and, and run analysis. Um, all in, it was probably $150,000 to instrument that site back then. Um, everyone thought I was crazy. My boss was like trying to understand how I was going to recoup the capital expense in my in, in my timesheet, so to speak. Um, but if you look at it now, what we can do with mobile, with sensors, with connectivity, uh, all of that, it's just become so much easier. It's plug and play uh, and a lot, a lot easier to do. Um, if you look at kind of some of the business models, the business models continue to change. I think in our industry, um, if you look at, especially on kind of the engineering consulting side or the architectural side, how do we move away from timesheets to kind of value-based rather than kind of timesheets? So there, there are, there's lots of space for, for new business models. Um, you're also seeing mass consolidation of, uh, of boutique firms, boutique companies. There's a lot of M&A that happens. When that M&A happens, you see mass consolidation, and then there's actually space for R&D. And, and we'll talk about that in terms of how we think about um, how we think about kind of R&D spend. Um, I would say there's also a new guard. You know, back in 97, when I was told, like, hey, it's always going to come down to a guy with a truck and a set of blueprints, um, I think that world has changed. I think if you see the the advent of drones and BIM. My belief system is if BIM hadn't have come along, we would have probably missed an entire generation to have any level of interest in our industry. But things like BIM started to feel like simulations, felt computational, and there was interest. But I do think we have a generation of leaders that actually think about technology. So if you think about your average CEO, is call it 50 to 60, maybe 70, but at least 50 to 60. Um, they have spent most of their career having a computer versus not having a computer. And, and that that makes a big difference versus a generation previously that didn't understand why they needed a computer and their assistant was still printing out their emails for them. So I think that actually tends to tends to really matter. Um, if you look at competitive risk, I don't think uh, in this day and age, you can operate the old way. I think there's an expectation specifically around a base level of technology. Um, I think, you know, yes, you should have an email address, but I think beyond that, I think there's also uh, a belief system that um, you should have a, a bare level of technology. And if you don't, um, then you're not going to compete. If you look at that, you know, if you think about companies like, Facebook slash Meta, you know, if you show up to their project meeting and roll out a set of blueprints, they're probably less excited considering their name is Meta and they have a belief in these technology systems. So I think the customers have a certain expectation these days um, that, that the market has to keep up with. So if you take kind of these market forces and these technical forces, um, you really are creating a perfect storm. And so when I showed you the first chart about like this being the era, that, that's where that comes from. Um, these, these con the convergence of these type of market forces are really driving, uh, driving that expansiveness. So let's talk about like why not. Um, so in a world of like, why isn't this working? What are the issues? Um, Peter Diamandis, if you haven't read his book, Abundance, it's a fantastic book. I recommend it to everyone who hasn't read it. I also re recommend if you have uh, high schoolers, middle schoolers, um, you make them read it too. It's it's a really fantastic book. And if you don't know much about Peter, he's um, he's done some pretty interesting things. But his I love his definition of innovation, and his definition is creating abundance where there was once scarcity. And and one of the examples he uses is. You know, if, if you could pick, a, pick trees off an apple, 
uh, off an apple tree. You can only pick the, the apples that were within reach. Somebody invents a ladder, and now you can pick all the apples. And so that's that's kind of innovation, right? So that's his idea. Now, the challenge in our market, if you think about innovation, is what I call the impedance mismatch. And so if there's any electrical engineers on the call, please ignore it because it's probably technically incorrect. But if you think about things running in phase and out of phase, we, we now have a market of innovation, whether it's the incumbents, which those of you that know me, I'm not a huge fan of. I don't think they really are interested in innovation. Um, but if you look at startups, if you think about the collective market of innovation for our industry, they are creating innovation at a speed at, at which the industry is unable to adopt. So it's kind of out of phase. And so what that means is no matter how much this market of innovation wants to move, if the market's not ready to adopt it at that phase, you're kind of, at, at that velocity, you're kind of out of phase. And that's why you see a lot of very innovative startups, quote unquote, ahead of their time. Um, they flame out. And there's a reason why sometimes in markets like ours, first to market, um, you are subjected to the learning curve of the market. You are subjected to a lack of interest and you're subjected to a small market because there's only a few people that'll take a chance on you. But that's also why you kind of see things like, you know, before Facebook, there was MySpace because they were just a little bit too early to market. And so um, you see this, this mismatch, so to speak. And then really, it, you know, for, for if you look at it, you, you have to think about innovation finding markets that are kind of in phase with them. So if you take two sides, because I know we've got startups and corporates, if you look at a startup, part of qualifying your customer is how do you believe them to be able to adopt your technology? Because if they are giving you all the signals, so pre-qualification for most startups is, do you have budget? Do you have the problem? All the typical things. But the X factor of culture is a great pre-qualification question. And if you are driving something that's truly innovative and the, the, the customer you're approaching doesn't have a process, I, you ask them, so tell me about how you do pilots. Tell me about how, tell me about the last three startups you worked with and they have no clue on how to work with you. There's a good shot you should maybe walk away. There's a good shot you say, hey, uh, would love to work with you. It doesn't look like you quite have the right resources to work with us, which is very tough for a startup because startups love to talk to anybody that's willing to talk to them. But you really have to think about long term, are they going to be able, be able to really support you and your product and the innovation you have in hand? The flip side is also true. In, in the world of do no harm for the corporates that are on the call, if you don't have a great process to work with a startup, instead of jerking them around and multiple meetings and more demos and fulfilling your curiosity of what's out there versus actually being able to have a process to do business with them. And under the guise of do no harm, you know, tell them like, hey, we're not in a position to do business with startups. And that's OK. Right. That is OK. Um, so, Madhav, I don't know, like, do we have the chat function, the Q&A function set up on Teams? No. It is, yes. OK, oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So. So this is the one and only interactive portion. This is a question I've asked <laughs> thousands of times. And so maybe you can kind of read off the responses as they come in. For some reason, I can't see the Q&A. So, so the question, the quiz is, um, you just got your brand new Tesla. You stopped off at Starbucks, got your uh, extra hot raspberry latte with oat milk. You put it in the cup holder and you're driving down the road. So you're driving down the road. Uh, your Tesla self-driving, I guess, or partially self-driving. Um, and you hit a pothole. And you hit this massive pothole. You're probably driving in the city of Atlanta, by the way, if you hit a massive pothole. Uh, unless we cover it up with our metal. We like the metal plates in Atlanta. Um, so you hit this massive pothole. Coffee cup flies out of the air. Coffee goes all over you. You pull over and you say, damn, somebody should solve this. This is a problem to be solved. So the question is, what's your solution? So please enter the chat Q&A, is it the Q&A function, Mana? And post yes. your answers. 
Yeah, they can enter it in the Q and A, and I also started a discussion. Okay. I see you, Will Mitchell. So, Will Mitchell, you can respond. William Potts. I have, I have a few names in front. <laughs> Is anybody responding, Mata? Yeah, iced coffee was the first response. Iced so. coffee. That's it. Okay. So you're just wet. You're not high. <laughs> Mom, what's your answer? Well, Will, you already Will know says, the actual answer. Will says I can't have a leaf in front of mind. I'm sorry. What's that? I said what Will was... said I have a link I'm trying to find. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Bill says put sensors in the Tesla that alert you to the potholes. Align the innovation with the pathway. Okay. Jared is is keeping it simple and just says lid. <laughs> Some responses coming in. Day says, I call KP first. KP will figure it out <laughs> for us. Uh, <laughs> uh, Maps feature that has the capability to report where potholes are and have your navigation avoid them. Another keep lid on the coffee. We'll post it. More coming in. Shockproof cup holder. That's an interesting one. Uh, and then Mark, like ways crowdsource the potholes, have it notify local governments. Got it. All right. All right. So I tend to get the same pattern of answers. Other than I haven't gotten the uh, stain proof shirt, um, et cetera. So, so the right answer is flying cars. So that's the right answer. The right answer is flying cars. So the, the question there is right. So that so the pedestrian problem is a pothole. Like oh, we see these potholes, and um, and we have multiple choices on how to solve that solution. So you know the what I call pedestrian problems. Um, innovators don't come back with pedestrian solutions, and you know um, th so the answer is flying cars. So if if that's the future, then when does the when can the flying car? We know there's a market for the flying car. Then it's a question of really like how do we get there. But in the meantime, all the iterative innovation that happens has to be adopted until you can find maybe the, the absolute solution. Um, you have the iterative iteration. So um, if you think about whether it's the, um, you know, the, the AI to find the potholes ahead of time, crowdsourcing the pothole, all that technology exists. The question is, will the market adopt it today? Or are they gonna say, well, I don't know if I wanna do all that. Or, the DOT says, God forbid the DOT says like, oh, we want to do innovation. Do they actually have the ability to procure and, and, and manage that kind of thing? So, so this is something I think both sides in a market where you have startups, you have customers, you really have to think about this cultural aspect and the process aspect to really be successful. And like in my first startup backed by my Discover card, um, you don't have infinite resources of time and money as a startup. So it's super important to really understand um, and ask the right questions before we invest a lot of time and energy in a customer that maybe doesn't have the right cultural fit to work with you. So, you know, when we look at kind of this framework, um, and, and it's interesting, you know, Part of developing this framework, um, I'd written a book called BIM for Developers and Owners back in 2011, and I built a framework there, which was the framework to adopt BIM, and specifically for the owners and developers. You know, the architects, engineers, and the contractors were already using BIM, but as a developer and as an owner, how do you use BIM? We really focused on um, building this framework to help them better adopt it. So. Between that and kind of the, the last couple of decades of trying to make this, make innovation happen in our industry, um, what we kind of developed was saying, okay, well, let's talk about like, what's the framework that people can use, specifically corporates. I know there's a lot of startups on here. I think the value of this webinar to a startup is really to maybe think about how the other side might be thinking and how to ask better questions. Um, when you're pre-qualifying a customer, if you're doing something truly innovative. So 
you know, part of the framework is kind of the where am I? Um, if someone says, you know, hey, you guys, you have an innovation group. Well, great. So what are you guys doing? What's your mission? Where, where are you at? Um, you have to have good answers to this stuff. And then for some people, it's how do I start? Um, I know I need to do innovation. I'm not sure even what that means. And by the way, innovation can mean different things to different companies. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, I love one of the things um, that I see pretty often is what I call unfunded innovation. So I've allocated a person's time to innovation. But besides their time, I haven't allocated any financial resources. So all of this takes time and money. Um, and what we find is the larger the company gets, it's really less about money. Money starts to look a lot like a commodity. It's really time and ownership and leadership um, from that company to drive it. So it's really more of a people factor as you move. If you, as you move into a large organization, it becomes about the right people. As you go downstream, it does tend to be more about, about money and having it. And then how do I track results? So when the board says, hey, you guys spent five million bucks on this innovation program, what's the ROI? What do we have to show for it? Uh, how are you progressing? That kind of thing. And then also what's appropriate for your organization? All organizations are different. Uh, an architecture firm looks a lot different than a uh, and in a large building products company like a Schneider Electric, they, they all look very different. And so what's appropriate based on your, your role in industry, as well as sizing? Um, I think it's, it's, it's super important and we'll kind of get into that. So this idea that one size fits all is, is definitely not, not the strategy. So here's kind of our broad framework uh, when you look at it. Um, you kind of look at these these six areas, these six vectors, so to speak. You look at kind of internal, which is how do you ideate? How do you build a strategy? Do you have an R and D budget? What are these internal things? Commercialization. Um, how do you adopt? How do, how are you just adopting technology? For example, um, everybody's talking about AI. Me and Manav, have, of course, I've been digging and digging and digging in. And whenever someone asks me about AI, I, I put their question in the AI and respond to them um, with the AI. So um, there's a lot going on there, but the question is like, so what are we doing? How are we doing it? Um, ex second area, second vector is external. So how am I looking at external innovation? Am I investing? Um, am I doing external pilots? Am I acquiring companies? Am I licensing companies, licensing technology for companies? How am I working externally? And then I think the third one is like just so different for our industry ecosystem. So if you're a large corporate in the beverage industry, your ecosystem is a uh, is your retailers and uh, supply chain providers. And, manufacturers. and it, it's a pretty small group uh, and it's pretty consistent. It's highly repeatable. I think what's really unique about our industry as people try to relate us to manufacturing, um, we actually look a lot less like manufacturing and we look a lot more like the movie industry, i.e. we work on a project, there's a set of actors, players, producers, directors, and then we all do this project together and then we all go home and we may or may not see those people again. We might have some favorites, we might have some favorite contractors we work with, we might have some favorite engineers we work with, but generally speaking, each project is its own um, own unique um, enterprise, so to speak. So the project is an enterprise. So if you look at that and you say, my weakest link on any project is driven by this ecosystem, this temporary ecosystem that comes together on a project, that my innovation strategy is limited by the weakest link. How do I prepare and understand and pre-qualify the subcontractors, the subconsultants that are working with me and really understand that. And I think for our industry, that is just very, very unique compared to maybe, you know, food and beverage or something else. So, uh, so we think that's pretty important. Um, the other thing around the ecosystem, people kind of forget the customer. <laughs> they always look downstream to them, but the customer is part of that ecosystem. And so how do you think about engaging with the customer and how you think about um, their role 
in the project around innovation um, becomes absolutely important. Um, fourth is culture. So the people factor, how are you driving accountability of the team? Um, what does what do execution playbooks look like? What are the expectations? Um, and we're going to dig in these a little bit. Um, blue sky. I mean, you got to think about the flying car, right? Um, so I think how do you think about what this business looks like in five years, 10 years? What does your role look like in five, 10 years? Um, you know, just to stay uh, in tune with the current narrative around AI, um, people I'm talking to that are actively, actively using AI, they're like, man, this AI is giving me the 80% solution. If I'm in marketing, I don't need a junior marketer anymore. If I'm in investing, I don't need an analyst anymore because the analyst was giving me the 80% solution. And then I had to add my expertise and all to the, to the next 20%. So, that, you know, the, the, the final 20% always costs you 80% of the effort. So, so really, we're seeing AI kind of come in and say, okay, well, if you really are using AI and, and understand how to use it, how does that change my, my industry, my business in the next five to 10 years? And so how do you start to capture those blue sky ideas and, and maybe work towards them, right? And then if you look at the six areas, like the tech adoption, like how are you testing it? How are you evaluating it? Uh, we have the, the good fortune of meeting with lots of startups and diligencing lots of startups. And we see startups that are built on foundationally either really limited technology. Sometimes it's fraudulent. They're building things on open source and purporting it as commercial. We see, we see all of the above. Right, we see things that are built on no code, and they, you know, um, they purport it as their IP. So there's a lot of process associated with tech adoption. Also interesting, you know, we we've worked with a lot of folks that are looking at build, uh, at acquiring or in um, using new technology, and they say, well, what do they go if they go out of business? And you know, we say, well, you can escrow their code, but if you escrow their code, that doesn't really help you if you don't know what it is in the event that they go out of business. Having their code is fantastic. That doesn't mean you can do anything with it. So really having a, a, a strategy around how you do tech adoption uh, is a big part of this. So we recently, um, prior for the last three or four months, we've been running this survey uh, across, um, across the market and we've gotten a um, pretty good response. And I thought it'd be interesting to kind of just share. And I think Mono is going to be publishing this uh, report in, in a couple weeks. Um, check out our, you can always check in our website and see when he posts it. Um, but some of the, some of the, the feedback we got was super interesting. When, one was when we asked the question of how important is innovation as a key differentiator in your company, um, you know, pretty high percentage said, you know, that, it, that it's, it's important, right? When you start to dig into some of these questions, um, it's, it's interesting the feedback we're getting. Keep in mind too, like in the report, we'll, full, we'll, we'll give the full release of like the demographics. Um, we're starting to see that it's becoming actually increasingly important to large companies, which is obvious, and to the really small companies. Some of the middle market companies are kind of saying, like, we're not sure. We don't know what we're doing. So they're kind of caught in the middle. When you think about uh, what's your R&D budget, that's actually a new construct for a lot of firms, whether it's construction or design, probably less so in the building product companies. Um, you know, if you're at Owens Corning or BASF, et cetera, chances are you have an R&D budget because you are actually inventing and creating things in the lab. Um, one of the interesting things when we ask questions about sizes of innovation team or just innovation in general, um, one of the cool things about uh, technology, and we can kind of see how long it takes people to answer certain questions. And it, it was pretty clear that when we asked uh, questions about team and around their size of their innovation team, or do they have a chief in the, uh, innovation officer, et cetera, there was a lot of pause. So I think there's what that, what that says is it's, it's not super clear to people, but most people, um, you know, according to our survey, just kind of said not applicable. You know, we don't really have, we don't have any essentially, uh, which is super telling. Uh, when we ask some questions around external, 
you know, how do they look and how they keep up to date. Um, interesting enough, um, it, it aligns with some of our mission. A lot of it seems to be peer learning, learning from people at conferences. Uh, I think what is fantastic about our industry is that um, while we can be super competitive, there's definitely a lot of willingness to share information and, you know, hey, what are you doing? Hey, we're looking at this. If you looked at that, um, people seem to collaborate pretty well on, you know, what's everybody else doing? Uh, you know, how do you look at funding innovation? Back to the how we operate on the at a project level. You know, it still seems to be like uh, seems to be that most of our market, most of our industry, is continually trying to fund innovation through projects. So I, I'm not going to fund it at a GNA level. I'm going to fund it at a project level, um, which which makes sense, right? I would say sometimes the data tells you what you kind of already know, but you know, we also see this with startups where startups start off working on a project because that's the easiest access. And then as they work on multiple projects, then they maybe move up through the enterprise. Um, but clearly the funding for innovation is still happening at a project level versus kind of at a, a GNA or at a strategic level. Um, how do we look at uh, approach on partnering and driving innovation? You know, I think if you see here, and I know it's kind of hard to see, um, but I think there really, you know, there there is an interest in working with startups. I think our industry likes the idea, but once again, I think it's um, it's it's early days, and there's a lot of, you know, they, there's initiatives, there's some framework, but it's still kind of early days. Clearly, larger companies seem to have a um, mostly have a better system to work with startups. A lot of them, especially in construction, where there's a lot of autonomy at a project level and at a field level or at a regional level. Um, there is still kind of a lot of, we're seeing a lot of fragmentation of, of how they're partnering with startups. So um, five different field, five different regions might be working with five different startups that do the same exact thing. And I know a lot of the folks on the call are trying to solve that for their organizations, but that still seems to be uh, a big part of it. Um, ecosystem, how do you look at external partners? Um, and, and how are you collaborating? Um, I think once again, you know, a lot of the information is that, hey, we're, we're trying to do our best. Uh, I thought this was interesting, the participation in industry associations and networks uh, to get the ideas. I think people continue or are continuing trying to like find the, I think the good news is everyone's looking for the answers outside of their organization. Um, the bad news, it's, it's also hard, hard to do so. Um, so the, you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about this, um, although the data might look less optimistic, um, but does your company have a designated innovation team? Quite honestly, I think if you asked that five years ago, the answer would have been no. Um, it would have been hundred percent no, probably. So I think that we're kind of call it 50, 50. I, I think that's pretty, uh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that. Some of y'all may not be, but I'm pretty optimistic about that. It's, it's, it's still early innings, but we are seeing people that are actually dedicating resources. Um, taking risk and risk taking, it, it's an interesting dynamic. You know, so much of risk taking is having information to actually understand how you can uh, mitigate risk and take calculated risk. I think the idea that most people said, we trust our leadership to take calculated risks. Uh, I found like really interesting in the fact that, you know, the word, the word trust, right? The word, this idea that we, we trust them, but, um, but there may not necessarily be a framework around how you take risk, right? So this idea that there's more trust versus having a formal risk framework, I think is, is a little bit fascinating. Um, at what point do they start thinking about, hey, we need to actually have a framework versus just trusting? Um, blue sky, which is always the fun part, you know, how often are people really looking at looking at blue sky opportunities and blue sky ideas? You know, 
uh, formally or informally. You know, sometimes informally it's uh, sitting at the bar at the end of a conference. Um, sometimes it's over a cup of coffee. But how often are you really looking at it? And I think there's the idea that as needed shows us that there's still kind of not a lot of structure around that. Um, and then we looked at how do you generate, you know, I thought it was interesting that people are doing brainstorming sessions. I do wonder at how well this is kind of being documented and, and looked at and, and, and what's the action, right? Is it, hey, we're going to sit around and talk about flying cars or do we have a path to thinking about how we're going to participate if flying cars show up tomorrow. Um, so last one, adoption. How are you doing it? Um, super interesting for you startups that you know, we have an informal process, right? Which I'm sure if I if I pulled all the startups, they'd say, yep, that sounds about right. Um, I, I think that's one of those things like, this question alone, if you're a startup, and you're engaging with a potential customer, this question alone might save you a lot of pain and suffering. Um, because if it is informal, um, there's two ways to look at that. One, you're going to spend a lot of educational cycles with that prospect, helping them understand and, and going through that. It could also mean if it's informal, that you might be able to hack your way through it. It might be that I, if I convince this one person, I can get in on. I can I can get them going. I can get a pilot going. So informal um, has, I, I would say, it has it's a double edged sword. Informal can mean like they could waste your time and you get to the end of the road, uh, and you've wasted all this time and energy. Or it could mean that there's because it's informal. Uh, if you can be clever, maybe there's a way in to get your product. Um, how do you implement innovation? Here, here's an interesting thing around having dedicated teams to pilot is that they're just going to be better equipped with, I would say, the, the informalities of a startup or maybe the lack of, you know, documentation or training or onboarding or customer success, all these things that maybe they expect out of some of the incumbent software providers or technology providers they work with. A dedicated team will, won't, won't ask the questions that they already know the answer to. Whereas a, um, a a team that's also implementing new um, large format printers and is also going to implement your new technology, they might need a bit, of, a bit of a tighter playbook and might get frustrated um, through that process. So um, I, I would say everything gets rehashed. So a lot of this, if you've... Um, Red crossing the chasm, et cetera. You know, this is just kind of our our flavor of crossing the chasm, so to speak. But I think what's interesting about kind of classification of companies, if you're a startup, probably don't want to chase laggards unless you have a, uh, a some kind of legacy product. But you know, my my question about this is always: if I am working in an organization and I kind of fashion myself as a disruptor, and that is where my biases are, and that is what I want to do with my career. And, and the company I work for is much more of a laggard company. Um, you might want to put your resume together. Might be time to move on to a different company, or you better have better hobbies. Um, because I do think there is an alignment. There's absolute alignment, just like when we talked about the the market of innovation and the the need to be in phase with the adoption side and with the market side. There's also a similar aspect to the culture of if you're working at a company and you want to do these super interesting things career wise and your company is less interested in it, um, you can just get super frustrated along the way and get nowhere. So I think that's always kind of a, at, a, at, a, at a personal level. It's a great question to ask yourself. How do you align with your organization and either either you're in a position, a leadership position to be able to drive that change? Possibly. Uh, or you might want to do something different. So this is one of these, I would say the interesting thing about like just the framework of innovation is how do you have to think about measurement? Um, what's interesting is if you look at the last, call it the last several years of our bull market, um, there has been a lot of driving innovation. As a guy that's been through a few cycles, 
where we've seen innovation flourish during an up cycle, especially in the world of corporates. They have all these innovation teams. They maybe even have a CVC. Things slow down. Things get a little bit uh, more difficult, and everybody moves back into their P&Ls, and the innovation group um, is, is more just a link on a website, but everybody actually is in a line of, goes back to a line of business. Um, having seen these cycles, um, what I've seen is the ones that do well are the ones that can actually communicate to the CFO. So when we look at a cycle like right now, I don't think we're 100% there in our industry. Things seem pretty busy. Um, but the shift of authority and power around resources in good times sits with the CEO and bad times sits with the CFO. And if you ever want to be prepared for the bad times and communicating to the CFO, uh, my advice is have quantitative data to support your to support your thesis. So while building KPIs may be not that popular in an up market, I think it's super important. But I think when you build your KPIs, understanding the maturity of your business, like where are you at in terms of your innovation, if it's your first year of launching an innovation practice or department or whatnot, I think you always need to factor in like it's year one. Um, this is what should be expected of me. I think the industry you're in, it matters. Like I said, if you're a large company, then you probably need a chief innovation officer. You probably have dedicated resources and a budget. And then I think goal setting is always, I don't care what business you're in, goal setting is always an imperative. Um, I think starting off with qualitative goals is, is okay, but I think you have to start understanding how those qualitative goal, goals can extend into kind of quantitative outcomes over time, i.e. it has to turn into math over time, but you might start with more qualitative things. Um, developing a reporting frequency, my view of that is like whatever it is, if it's an annual report, if it's quarterly, if it's weekly, whatever it is, pick a format that you can stick to. Um, if all you do is spend your time reporting, that's probably not a great idea. Um, but whatever it is, the last thing you want is for an executive that maybe isn't 100% bought into the innovation strategy of your firm. When they say, hey, where are we? I haven't heard anything from so-and-so in a minute. I mean, are they even gonna report anything back to us? You just don't wanna be that person that is being asked like, hey, can you get an update? So-and-so wants an update. Um, my advice is have a frequency, have a standard report and stick to it. Um, consistency, early days of, uh, of launch, consistency is much more important than the actual quantitative results. Um, also, this idea that the higher ups um, will, are, are gonna use your system and method of how to engage with you know, your reporting and how you do things isn't realistic you know that your board of directors probably isn't using slack they might have heard of it but they probably aren't using slack and i joke around that we still send printed hard copies of our annual report and people love them um so it's it's also know your audience for your, for how you report things back so the only sales pitch of our thing if you don't think you can do it yourself and you need help. We actually have a whole framework and process that we run. Um, Manav leads that, that effort. And this is kind of what we work through. I think there, there's, there is a benefit to trying to do things yourself. Um, if you have the time, you know, what I call the, the comp competency and capacity to do so. If you have that, definitely, um, try to do it yourself. It's great learning, you know, great learning process. Um, I think there's a benefit of a third party. One, just leveraging the, the decades of experience of the third party. And then two, when it comes to interviewing, one of the things we love to do is interviewing the ecosystem um, to really understand their perception of the, of the client and how they view their innovation processes, you know, you might, you know, if you're a GC, you might think, hey, we're doing great. We go talk to your electrical sub and they're like, yeah, great might be a stretch, right? So we just get a, a, a different, a, we have a different conversation than maybe you have with your uh, ecosystem partners. So, um, so yeah, so hit up Monov if you have any questions about that. And then from there, I think we have enough time for some Q&A.
Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, KP. So uh, as KP mentioned, please go ahead and enter your questions into the Q and A or into the chat, um, and we can, we can go through and read them. Um, KP, you did have one that came in um, while you were speaking. You can get in there. Um, if a startup or innovative solution is to focus on one specific actor, how to break the barrier with the architects and engineers who are comfortable with the incumbents, right? How do you how do startups innovators de-risk the adoption, including you know permitting agencies, procurement decision makers, etc. Yeah, I mean that it, it's a really good question because um, it's that the, there's an old adage: nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM. Um, there's a little bit nobody got fired from buying software from Autodesk or Procore, or whoever. So for sure, um, I think it's it's really trying to focus on this is where understanding your your product and feature compared to the incumbent. So if you take your product feature matrix and you take the incumbent's product feature matrix, you have to look for a weakness in the incumbent. Now that weakness has to align with a pain that the customer might experiencing. Then they might take a risk, right? Then they might um, then they might say, yeah, you know, it turns out they don't, you know, we're better at mobile or they don't have mobile. And the customer says, we really need a mobile solution that becomes um, that becomes the way in, right? So you're never going to go head to head. If you if anyone's read Sun Tzu, you, you never go head to head. You always flank, right? So as a startup, you got to flank. Um, so I think I would, and and I think communicating that to them, you know, the idea that the prospect's going to go do this product feature um, assessment and transpose your product against the incumbent and figure it out themselves. That that's a that that's a fallacy. But I think if you go to that prospect and say, hey, I know here's what Revit does or here's what Procore does. Here's what I do. And here's where the gap is. And we're really good at, at this. We're very good at where this company is weak. Um, is that important to you? That Then that's that's kind of the chink in the armor. Thank you. All right. Uh, another question came in. Uh, do you think having a dedicated innovation team is a good thing, or does it absolve the balance of the organization from developing an innovative mindset or an innovation mindset? Sorry. Um, I think it. I, I get it, right? But I think I think having a dedicated team is super important because I think if you look at like innovation and people, you know, if it's just like this ideation thing. I think it's imp it's important that um, your innovation team still be super approachable and be somehow matrixed out, whether region, whether business line, or whatever, and actually have engagement with the business line. The other the other thing is a business an innovation group can become very myopic if they kind of are just hanging out with themselves. And so I think it is important to have even I think I think it being dedicated to it because there is some muscle memory and. Um, that, that's created by doing the same thing every day, but I, I don't think it means you become myopic. I think there has to be a formal method in which they work within the business lines and the people on the ground. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, I think we have time for, for maybe one more question. If anyone has any other questions, um, let's just go ahead and throw them into the chat. You know, it's Friday though, so everyone probably wants to get off and into their next meeting, not be late for the day. So I totally get that as well. Uh, so uh, with that being said, um, thank you everyone for, for making the time today. As KP mentioned, um, we will be publishing, you know, that I will be publishing the report with all of our findings from our innovation survey uh, here in the next couple of weeks. Um, so everyone, uh, please be on the lookout for that on our website. Uh, and if anyone needs help with anything or we can answer any more questions that anyone thought of, please, please reach out and contact information is right up on the page. All right. Thank you all so much. Have a great Friday. See you.